probably extrapolate and say that the earliest weapon that humankind used was probably a rock in the hand or a stick in the hand. And at some point, our forefathers made the connection between tying a rock and a stick together and they came up with a primitive hammer or a club. So there's nothing new about this. One of the oldest ways in the world of amplifying speed and force by adding weight and reach to the hand. Weapons of opportunity are what Krampa Guy is all about. And if you're in a situation where you're able to lay your hand on a hammer, it's good to know what to do with it, except for just swiping wildly and hoping for the best. So let's quickly talk about the physics of a hammer. It's, it's, it's low-tech. You swing it, you hit somebody in the head or on the arm, or whatever it is, and they get badly hurt. And that's pretty much all there is to it. There, lesson over, we can go home now. You guys cool? No, I'm kidding. There's a little bit more than that. We're dealing here with a tool that has a heavier head than the shaft. So it's weighted right near the end. That means that when I swing it, I'm accruing a great deal of force and momentum right at the tip, which is what it's designed to do, to hit a nail into whatever. So it means that it works best when there's a great deal of swing, a great deal of force behind it, assuming I want to crunch something really hard. Now we know in a, shall we call it a self-defense or a combat context, if I do big wild swings with something, Generally, it leaves me open to being charged or counter-attacked by my opponent if those are big uncontrolled swings and there's a heavy object in my hand that actually slows my hand down. You can't, there's no denying that I can move my empty hand faster than I can move my hand when it has a weight in it. There may be a small difference, but it's there. And so how do we change the physics of the body and the physics of a tool like a hammer to make up for that shortcoming? There are two ways of doing it. One is Instead of thinking of rotating the hammer around your body, and I'm talking general physics here, we want to have a change in mindset and think of rotating your body around the hammer. What does that mean? Let's use that as example number one. If I rotate the hammer around my body, I've got to swing this thing and it, it has to come to rest somewhere. I've got to deliberately slow it down or reverse direction or wheel it around. And that takes time, no matter how skilled and no matter how strong or fast I am. But if I think of this thing, at the moment it reaches its intended target, I can increase the speed of return by simply shifting my body. And you can try this for yourself. I see Vic has a hammer there in his hand. If you swing, if you stand still and simply swing the hammer like that from side to side and do so as you know, quickly and under control as you can without hurting anybody, including yourself, you'll find that there is actually a moment in which there's a lot of drag, a lot of pull. If you do the same action, and at the moment of hit, you take a tiny step in the direction that the hammer came from. You'll be surprised at what happens. It instantly recycles with almost no effort. By changing the source of the momentum, you immediately alter what's happening after you've hit or at the moment of hit. By the same token, if I'm doing just a simple diagonal overhand swing like that, and I want to increase the force without necessarily wanting to recycle too quickly, then I step toward the direction it's going. So in other words, if I want to decrease the rotation time or bring it back quickly, I step in the direction it came from, like that. And if I want to increase the force, I step toward the direction it's going. Because then I'm recruiting bodily momentum and acceleration and the mass, and my mass of the hammer as well, in order to inflict damage. So that's principle number one. Rotate around the hammer in order to increase the speed of it or step in the direction it's going to increase the force that it's delivering. And there are moments in doing simple drills with a tool like this that you can actually do both. You can increase the momentum and the force by stepping in, and you can increase the, shall we call it, the pullback or the drawback or the recycle by immediately stepping again in the direction it came from. I'm not talking about hopping forward and backward. I'm talking about taking a step to one side and the other. It could even be a small foot shuffle or a sway. So, for example, I step in that direction to increase the power, because that's where the hammer's traveling, and I immediately just take a small step across, like that. So it's a darting in. And you guys are familiar with this. We do this in Krav Maga a lot. We talk about flanking. We talk about the principle of stepping around the imaginary ball in front of an opponent. And that enables us to deliver greater force, to move faster, and to use circular momentum. It's the equivalent of swinging a stone on a string rather than trying to you know, poke somebody with a stick. The other thing to bear in mind, and the second principle, is that there are hinges 
they're invisible hinges, don't take me literally, but they're hinges in your body around which you rotate. The one we're all familiar with, the one that we use all the time, is our spine. When we turn, we rotate around our spine. The body naturally does that. When you walk, when you turn, whatever it is, it's a no-brainer. And generally, we fall into the trap of thinking that that is the only vertical hinge that we can rotate around. So, you know, if we think of doing that and simply turning the body, I'm rotating around my spine, okay? But what if I shift my spine in an imaginary sense to one side of my body or the other? What if I shift my spine from here to there? Now, I rotate around this point if I see that as a vertical line through my body. So I can either rotate around the spine like this, or I can rotate around this point by simply moving this foot forward. So now I'm doing that. And if you look at the use of heavy weapons throughout history, things like clubs and swords and flails, etc., that is exactly the way they train to use them. They don't stand there and try and swing them because that's an inefficient movement. What they do is, the moment they move the weapon, they move around the furthest point of their body, or the you know, point of the torso, should I say. So somebody wielding a heavy two-handed sword is taught not to do this, but rather to move this foot forward and to do this. Because they had an intuitive or scientific understanding of physics that says it's like a door opening. If I swing the door open, the part of the door that's swinging open is going to bump the other guy. And if there's a sword attached to it and the sword is being swung quickly or the hammer or whatever it is, it increases the force. So what does that tell us? It tells us footwork plays an enormous role in using a weapon that, is, you know, that carries some weight. When you're using a light weapon like a knife or a pen or something like that, it's very easy to kind of be stationary and just whirl that in arcs around your body and move your hands. But the moment you introduce something heavy, we need to start thinking in terms of, do I rotate around this thing? And at which point do I rotate around this thing? That's vitally important. And you can enter into a lifetime study of arts like that, which take a long time and make you very skilled. But for our purpose in this video, I'm just simply going to talk about distilling a couple of the basics, keeping it very, very simple. I want you to be able to go through this little class, this tutorial, and be able to use this thing with a fair degree of skill and likelihood of success as a self-defense weapon. There are a couple of pointers. The first pointer is the grip. As we do with something like a machete, we want the, the majority of the gripping to take place with the first three fingers of the hand. So your pinky finger, your ring finger, and your middle finger. That's, that's where the, the rubbery, firm grip takes place. The forefinger and the thumb Think of them as squeezing rather than holding on rigidly. So they're kind of squeezing to allow some, some wrist momentum and some movement while your little finger stays kind of glued throughout. This is also really important because if you hit something, there's the risk that this could get knocked out of your hand by the force. And if your little finger, if your pinky finger and your ring finger aren't secured at that point, then it's very easy for this to get knocked out of your hand or taken out of your hand. The other consideration is that I need to have a grip that is a little bit higher up, if possible, if I have time to think about it, on the shaft of the hammer, on the handle. I want to be in a position where I'm not holding it right at the edge, for a number of reasons. First of all, accidents happen, I bump my hand and this thing flies out of my hand. Uh, it makes it easier for someone to twist or grab it out of my hand like that. Um, and it's not nice to think about, but there could be blood on this thing. And blood is very slippery, it's like cooking oil. And if my hand is over there, the hammer can slip off really easily. I want to have some give. I want to have some space right here at the hilt of the hammer. So in terms of gripping, there's, let's call it the orthodox, the normal grip, standard grip, whatever you want to call it. Standard grip, there it is. I'm holding the hammer firmly like that. Nothing, nothing to it. Very, very simple. Now we call this the standard long grip. And the long grip imp implies that it's allowing the length of the hammer to work for me. I'm able to reach or that I'm able to swing. The corollary of that, the alternative to that, is what we call the short grip. And the short grip is simply letting the, the hammer slide down like that and holding it just under the head. You want to hold it in such a way that, you know, depending on what hammer you have in your hand, it could be a ball peen hammer, it could be a claw hammer like this, it could be a kitchen tenderizing hammer, it could be anything like that. You don't want the back of the hammer if it is curved like this, to rest into your thumb or into your wrist, because that kind of twist or even a hit here can cause you pain. 
You want to try and catch it so that it's just down the back of your hand or off the back of your hand. You're not going to be doing any fancies with this. This is primarily for hitting at close range or pushing or raking or gouging. Why would I switch to a grip like this as opposed to a grip like that? Surely the long grip gives me a lot more swing and a lot more momentum. The answer is if I'm at close range, in other words, somebody has grabbed hold of me and I'm grappling with him and he's trying to control my hand, we're just about you know, hugging each other, it's very hard to swing a hammer in a space like that. So it's very easy in a situation like that to just drop the hammer into the short grip and now I can start using this as a punching or a pummeling tool or a close range ripping or hooking tool. One of them is called a flip grip and that's very simply where I, for example, have done a strike with a hammer and I flip it around and I come out like that. There are certain instances where I might do that. It's not in the middle of a self-defense situation where you'd you know, swing the hammer and switch it and come out like that. It's great for fancy martial arts, it's not great for self-defense. But, once again, I may be in a situation where I'm, uh, I'm defending myself, we're in a fight, and he grabs my wrist, he grabs the hammer. Let's say he gets a hand on the hammer's shaft, and now it's tug of war. Here, he and I are both battling for the hammer. If his hand is here, and I have a grip on the hammer, I can do one of two things. I can either break his hand off the hammer, or I can simply release this grip, grab there where I have lots of purchase. At that point, I can hang off a cliff on this thing, and he has less purchase than I do. I'm using simple biomechanics to retrieve my weapon, to retrieve my tool. He's grabbed the hammer, we're wrestling for it. All I'm doing is I'm grabbing there, I'm releasing here, and now I'm using this limb to strike his hand potentially off the hammer, or to grab and lever, whatever I'm going to do. Gouge him in the eyes, grab him in the groin. But this, he'll have a great deal of trouble getting out of my hand. I can, you know, I'm not going to stay like this. This is a silly way to use a hammer. It's a temporary way station between one situation and another, if needs be. Instead of holding it like that, I'm essentially holding it like that. That's all. Once again, this is not the way you'd commonly use a hammer. But I may be in a situation where I've taken a swing and for some reason my hand has been latched onto and I choose to grab with the other hand and just switch my hand around. This allows me to control more of the hammer against my wrist and allows me to hit in a very different way. I can now start using this like an elbow strike. So I can, for example, go into an opponent like that. I can come up under the chin. So there's some force there and I can stab straight out using the hilt. The hammer falls to the ground. You're in the middle of a fight, the hammer falls down. I pick it up and I have to pick it up like this instead of the right way. And he's taking a swing at my head. Instead of me trying to shield and get this thing the right way, it's very simple once I understand that I can use this to shield with or attack with or hook with, it becomes a lot more versatile. The first and most logical stroke or strike to use with a hammer is the thing that we all do when we're knocking in a nail or chopping wood or whatever it is. We simply swing the thing in an overhand movement. When the weapon goes out, the other hand comes in. Notice I'm shielding my vital organs. I'm using that hand to strike the shoulder and fold the body. And again, this is a way of increasing the force and the speed of the hammer in my hand. I can recycle. I can come out of this and use that hand to push into a chin or to slap an ear or to grab so that I can bring the hammer back and use it in different ways from there. But this hand essentially should never be floating out there at the same time that I'm swinging a weapon. That's common knowledge and we know that. The diagonal stroke is very simple. Out that way, simple figure of eight, and back across the same way, and recycling easily up just near the shoulder. We're not having to do any fancy twirling because it's too heavy and you're too much risk of losing the weapon. But all I'm doing is keeping it in a, in a fairly firm grip and just doing that. Just kind of recycling it up. Boom, boom. And you'll find that the weight of the head of the hammer brings it up really easily for you. You'll also find that if you stand still and try and do this, it pulls you all over the place. Your body will, will understand that in order to recycle it, I need to move that way and this way in order for that to happen. There, there. Okay, so that is your diagonal strike. So a long stroke is out there. There's, there's a long diagonal. I'm heading in there, bringing it back, and going out again and striking from there. One, two, is I'm shortening the range and I'm increasing the power by now striking. Instead of throwing the hammer out like that, I'm whipping my elbow down. I'm thinking of leading with the elbow and leading with the hand. The hammer almost follows 
at close range like that as it comes down. Okay, so one, two. From your shoulder, just send it out, recycle, send it out, recycle, and then bring it in short. Drop the elbow across, drop the elbow across, and then make it long again. Out to the front, out to the front, close, close. Long stroke, long stroke, short stroke, short stroke. We know that when we deploy a knife, our home position is customarily here, assuming an ice pick grip. Uh, if we're holding a knife in a saber grip, it's here near the shoulder. That's usually where we start from. If we're deploying a stick of some sort or a baton, our home position is customarily here near the shoulder. By comparison with those, a hammer can't be deployed in either of those positions, and I'll tell you why. It can, but it's risky. If I hold it near my body, if I do this, it means that if somebody throws a mild kick or a push or a, you know whatever it is, or runs into me, there's a very real risk that this could come into me and injure me, or simply get trapped against my body where it's really difficult to pull it away. If I carry it up here, it's also very easy, if I initiate movement from here, for people to jam my arm in or to see the change in silhouette, which makes it easier for them to react in time and stop this from happening. It's also easier for someone to, for example, grab me from the side or behind and strip this out of my hand. So what do I do? What's the most logical way of deploying a hammer in a home position? What I teach is, for something like this, your home position should be near your hip or near your ribcage here, yeah, just into your side. So you're kind of tucking the elbow down, you're just keeping the hammer right over there, and the other hand is up to guard your face or to guard yourself from there. It looks very unassuming, but what it means is that if somebody is reaching for that hammer from the front, first of all, I've got this hand available to clear all that space and take the hand away so that from here I can retaliate in any one of a number of ways. It also means that if somebody grabs it from behind or tries to trap my arm, I'm in a position where I can react a lot more easily and come to a power position from here, either by grabbing the, the, the hammer and putting it into my body or simply turning my body. If somebody grabs and I turn, this happens. And I now have the opportunity to get control of my weapon and retain it more efficiently. In order for me to strike an opponent from here, I need to do that. Okay, and you'll see when I do that, there's a whole lot of jerkiness through the body, a whole lot of telegraphing taking place. It's quite easy to kind of see that coming, even though it's fairly fast. If I hold it into my hip and I do the same movement, like that, it's almost as though I'm pushing the hammer out and as I push it out, I'm now dropping my elbow. I just want to mention that in terms of shifting your grip from a standard long grip to a standard short grip, of course you can just drop the hammer in like that, but you can also make it part of a dynamic movement. If you think about doing something like a, a stab, straight stab with the, with the hammer, if you're up close and somebody has a head or a body available, I don't need to hold onto the hammer firmly and do that, I can do that and allow myself to get into a short grip so that by the time I close with him I'm at close range where I can now start hitting and raking and punching that way I already am in the position I need to be. If I move away from that and I need to regain my grip here, I can't do awkward things like that. The easiest way to get from a short grip to a standard long grip is to come back to my home position. Look what happens. Boom. One of the things that it's essential to practice with a weapon like this is switching hands. And the easiest way to do that is to learn how to do it off a diagonal strike. So we stand and we do a couple of diagonal strikes, just do long ones out there, let your body move to accommodate the movement. It's a, it's a flow, it's like a dance. And as I've said before in these videos, I can't dance to save my life, but the feeling is the same. There's a rotation around the hip, there's a whole lot of things that happen inside the body that allow you to accelerate this and the more relaxed you are, the easier it is to recruit your whole body into the movement. Now, when do I change hands? How do I do it? The answer is I change hands when the hammer is on the side of the hand that I want to change to. I don't want to do this and then try and change hands here. I want to bring it up here. Okay, and when it's on the side of the body that I want to change to, and I simply switch that hand around, I'm in a very natural position like kind of a T-Rex, my hands are right over here, and as this comes up, my hand is already here, it's ready to take the weapon and continue the stroke, like that. 
and I found that the best way to actually send this out, and it's just personal preference, you can angle your hand any way you like. I find that the best way to send it out is with my palm up, generally, like that. So I may, for example, you know, use the hammer to, to parry whatever's coming my way. But from there, instead of taking the long route around and counter-striking, how easy is it to go from any position when you wind up here? You're parrying that way, you're parrying that way, you're hooking down, whatever it is. You're generally in this kind of position. The easiest and most economic attack from there is simply to do that. Most people who see you holding a hammer, even if they are attacking you and you're defending yourself, their assumption is that you're going to do this and try and hit them with a hammer the way they're used to being hit. They, very few people expect to see you come from this position and do that because that is very demoralizing and it's a way of entering into his space and setting you up for other attacks. You can strike into the face and we'll do a couple of combinations in a minute. You know, face, the groin, push, hook, etc. A number of things you can do from that position. What we do is, as this flies out, all I'm doing is taking this hand and slapping into the back of my wrist or my forearm. So instead of going there, I'm going there. If I'm coming back this way, it's even easier because that's already there. Forehead stroke, like that. I'm whipping it down using the power of this arm to accelerate the, the hammer down and through. As it recycles, or whether I'm coming from this direction, this hand should be near my body so that from there I can strike and cycle it through. I'm not going to follow it all the way through with this hand. I'm not, I'm not stuck to this arm. It's there like a rocket booster. It's there to give it a little bit of just to get it through. But this hand stays here because this is part of my defense. The nice thing about using this for a hilt strike is that it's heavy. It carries a tremendous amount of force because all of that kinetic energy is expressed linearly down into one small point. It's incredibly powerful. You can just you know, do that on your own arm and feel it for yourself. It's really uncomfortable. These kind of movements where your body is moving around the hammer and you're recycling easily and rhythmically. And as your body gets used to that and you feel better about it and you're more confident, start making the circles a little bit smaller. Start doing the movement in a smaller space. So reduce it by half and then reduce it a little bit more again so that you can start thinking about instead of rotating around the shoulder or the elbow, you can now rotate around the wrist and use that as your point of reference. I don't necessarily need to do that in order to parry what it is. I may choose to parry using my live hand and from here simply reach down into the groin. So a ripping stroke is the kind of thing you would use into an opponent's groin, rip, into the knee, back of the knee and rip. Uh, you won't be able to see this on camera but you could from here drop down onto one knee and hook under the, under the ankle or the shin and yank out to take balance. And of course, pretty much anywhere on any of the limbs or the neck, do a typical diagonal strike like that. And in terms of coming back, I may elect, instead of coming over here where he's expecting me to go, just to simply change direction at the bottom and swing this up like that and hook into the head, into the ear, or strike with the back of the hammer. So I'm inflicting that kind of strike. At another level of practice, the other person may have a weapon in their hand and I have trapped their arm or something like that and I have access to the weapon to disarm him. In which case, I can keep it simple and hammer the thing out of his hand, or I may choose to go around the arm, hook the wrist, and strip, and do that in order to break the hand, break the thumb, take the weapon out, so that from there I can counterattack. I've got the guy preoccupied here. As, as that happens, I'm simply crossing the foot. And now I just spin my body. I whip my head around, my head leads, hammer follows, and this comes around like that. Three very simple attack drills that I want to share with you, and there are hundreds of these that you can do. The first one is just simply a two strike sequence. And once you've done that, then what you want to do is, I'm just doing this from the front so you can see what's happening. Instead of bringing this all the way back, I simply allow the hammer to drop and pivot in my hand like that. So I'm doing a stab, allowing this to come over, and it's almost as though I'm turning a steering wheel with my hands like that. Okay, one, two. One, and two, bringing this hand out as a distraction and whipping this past your shoulder and into the target like that. Cool with that guys? The next attack I want to share with you is almost laughably simple but it's really really effective in terms of confusing an opponent and it's called the cross hands entry and you guys I think some of you will recognize this from your Krav Maga class where 
In certain circumstances, we use both hands to ward off an attack by doing that. Shielding the face, going out and then from there collapsing through and striking an opponent or dragging him in. And we use the same principle with the hammer. The one thing to be very uh, clear about is that the hammer is always on top. We don't put the hammer underneath like that because now I can't go anywhere with it. If it's on top, I can wheel it around and use it in all kinds of directions. So all I'm doing is from here, I'm stepping in and doing that. This is customarily either a parry, fully come incoming grab or a strike or whatever it is. His attention, trust me, is going to be on this thing. He's not too worried about what the other hand is doing. And if I'm putting the hammer up there, that's what he's focusing on. And that's what I want. I want to get his attention up there. And the moment that happens, I just take my free hand, I push it forward as I recycle the hammer and I inflict a stroke down. So whether you're actually parrying somebody's hand coming in or weapon coming in toward you, or simply using it as a setup, it works both ways. So it's parry, swing, and stab. Parry, swing, stab. It'd be kind of there, 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 and chase him down as you go in. From here, it's easy to recycle in any direction at all. There, there, across, hook, rip, whatever you want to do. The live hand is there for distraction. If I'm only doing this, it's very easy for an opponent to focus on this thing and to try and neutralize it, dodge it, catch it, whatever he's going to do. But if I'm using my other hand as well, and I'm doing that kind of thing, it's very hard for him to see which one is the actual threat. Because we do Krav Maga, it's not just about the hammer, is it? In that process, I could be inflicting low kicks to the knees or the groin. I could be grabbing, ripping, tripping, pushing. I may have opportunity to rip an ear or to headbutt the guy. And that's okay. Very, very simple, very short. That's kind of a basic introduction, if you like, to the simplistic use of a hammer in a very, very limited framework of striking, parrying, and ripping.